everyone, a very warm virtual to our special diversity debate. Uh, this is part of the AIC Diversity and Arbitration Week 2021. And this diversity debate is special because it's collaborations with the ICCA Cross Institutional Task Force on Gender Diversity. So um, I've seen um, more people logging in. Let's just uh, give it um, a, a, a a minute or two for, for uh, more participants to join. Uh, while we're waiting for more people to join, I have a few housekeeping matters that I would like to convey to the members of the audience. Uh, we will have two polling sessions uh, for today. One will be launched shortly, uh, just before the debate kick starts. So we really hope, uh, we look forward to your engagement. The second poll uh, is going to be done before the question and answer sessions. Now, um, I'm sure you're all very interested to ask a lot of, a lot of questions to our panelists um, after they finish the debate session. So if you want to pose your questions, uh, please do so uh, by putting uh, by inserting your questions in the question and answer box in your Zoom. Um, okay, I think um, we can start now. And I have been tasked to introduce our lovely moderator for today. Uh, and she doesn't need introductions because she, uh, because of who she is, but she's getting just a short one uh, from me. So Miss Louise Barrington, as you know, is a chartered and bilingual member, uh, bilingual arbitrator and mediator. She is based both in Toronto and Hong Kong. As you know, Louise um, uh, is the founder of the Fees uh, Fees uh, is Mood and also the honorary president of the arbitral women, right? So, um, Louise, before I hand over the session to you, I will display the very first poll. You should be able to see it on your screen right now. Um, I think we can give a minute for the participants to vote. This is the most active pollings I've ever seen throughout uh, the entire um, AIC webinar series of Diversity Week. I can tell that almost everyone is voting. Okay, 12 minutes, I'm uh, sorry, 12 seconds left before I close the poll and display the results. Right, I'll go and this now and then sharing the results. Very interesting. Sent. <laughs> all right. So without further ado, Luis, the floor is all yours. Well, and the participants didn't get a chance to vote, by the way, so they couldn't skew it in their favor. So good morning or good evening, whatever it is where you are. And you've seen the proposition. Today, we're going to focus on um, diversity from two different angles. We're going to first focus on gender diversity, which as I'm fond of saying is easier to address because women are universal. We are half of every population that wants to be studied and we are visible and so we're easily countable. The arbitral institutions have recognized this and thanks to Mireille Philippe who with uh, was co-founder with me of uh, Arbitral Women many years ago. Mirez actually did the first uh, inquiry into the statistics of women in, in arbitration about 10 years ago, and that has taken off uh, to what we know today, where the institutions regularly re report their statistics on gender. It may not fully address the issue, but we, because uh, we don't know how many appointments are of the same three or four women, or uh, anything about the quantity and value of the cases, but uh, it's a beginning. We'll also be looking at other aspects of diversity, namely ethnicity and geography. And uh, here the information is less available and the way forward perhaps less obvious. Um, if you entered a room of arbitrators in 1993, as I did with 250 arbitrators and found eight or nine women there, that was about par for the course. Today, it would be half as we all know. With other diverse 
groups, it's a little bit different because it's, as I said, easier to count. Things like sexual or orientation, physical limitations, things like that are, are invisible. We're going to concentrate, as I said, on ethnicity and geography. We won't be dealing with age because that's still another conversation. So we've had our poll. You've seen that the affirmatives are way above every uh, uh, at the top with 100%. I've never seen a poll like that before, but there it is. Our format is going to be similar to the recent uh, U.S. presidential debates. So I'll ask a question which will be addressed to one person from the affirmative team and one person from the negative team. Uh, follow, uh, and then, and then um, um, when they've done, we'll, I'll ask another question and we'll have a couple of rounds like that with our debaters. So on the affirmative team, we have um, four in, interesting and very active speakers. Um, we have, uh, we have on the affirmative team, we have uh, Jennifer Iris. Jennifer, put your hand up so we can see you. There you are, okay. Um, Jennifer is a senior associate with the International Arbitration Group of White and Case and a member of the ICA Cross-Cultural Task Force on Gender Diversity. Um, on the affirmative team with uh, Jennifer is Lillian Wong, and Lillian is a partner at Shern Delamore in Malaysia. Uh, Shern Delamore is one of uh, Malaysia's largest and oldest law firms, as you probably all know. Then on the negative team, we have Ashley Jones, who's a senior knowledge lawyer in international arbitration with Freshfields Brookhouse Derringer, and uh, the, she's the uh, sec uh, secretary of the ERA um, uh, Gender Diversity Group, and also contributed to uh, the ICA uh, report. And last but not least, we have on the negative team, Daniel Chua, who's an associate with Herbert Smith Freehills. Um, arbitration practice, of course, again, and he's in KL. He's also an adjunct lecturer at, at Taylor's University, teaching ADR and dispute resolution. So here are our four speakers, and I'm going to start right away. And that was the first question, which will be, uh, um, uh, as I said, on, on, on gender. So I'm going to ask Ashley to address that first. Um, um, and the question is this, how successful has the international arbitration community been at improving gender diversity in the field in recent years? And you have five minutes, Ashley. Thanks, Louise. Um, in arguing against the proposition for this debate, I will explain why the arbitration community has already successfully charted the way in advancing gender diversity and how gender diversity is flourishing as a result. Uh, as Louise mentioned, my teammate Daniel will cover ethnic and geographical diversity in his response next. I will argue that no further initiatives are required other than the passage of time to allow the good work that has been done so far to have full effect. If we start by looking at the statistical evidence, since the launch of the Equal Representation and Arbitration Pledge in early 2016, which called for the publishing of gender appointment statistics, most of the major arbitral institutions now publish this data annually. This makes it possible to monitor and track progress in the number of female appointments. The ICA Task Force report, published in July 2020, analyzes the data and revealed that over the five years between 2015 and 2019, the average number of female arbitrators being appointed nearly doubled from around 12% in 2015 to 21.3% in 2019. The evidence shows a steady upward trend is taking place. Although we have not yet reached fair representation or parity, the evidence shows we are heading in the right direction. The statistics for 2020 indicate that this trend is continuing among the main commercial arbitration institutions. The LCIA reported female appointments at a record high of 33%, up from 29% the year before. The SEC reported a big increase to 31% compared to 23% in 2019. The ICDR's figure was up to 27% from 24% in 2019, and the ICC rose steadily to 23% in 2020, up from 21% the previous year. Looking at the breakdown of statistics in more detail, we can see that it's the arbitral institutions that are making the greatest progress compared to the parties and co-arbitrators when it comes to appointing women. The LCIA appointed 45% female arbitrators in 2020, 
The SCC appointed 47% and the German arbitration institution appointed 53%. The ICC figure also rose significantly from 23% in 2019 to 37% in, 2020 in terms of its own appointments. These arbitral institutions are providing important and valuable opportunities for female arbitrators, including first-time appointees, to gain valuable experience as arbitrator. Over time, this will lead to a greater pool of experienced female arbitrators um, available for selection, not only by the institutions, but also by parties and co-arbitrators who are less familiar with the pool of new arbitrators with the right qualifications. In addition to the statistical evidence, there is other evidence to suggest that gender, di gender diversity is flourishing. We now have our first female president of the ICC court, Claudia Solomon, who took office this week. This is a significant milestone in ICC history. Indeed, it was awarded the best development of 2020 at the GAR Awards last week. The ICC had already reached gender parity in terms of its court members in 2018, and the most recent composition of the court announced on 1st of July is the most diverse yet in terms of both geographical representation and, in, and the number of women. Women have been at le in leadership positions at the other arbitral institutions for many years, including the LCIA, ICSID, and the SCC. The last two ICA presidents have been women, Lucy Reed and Gabrielle kaufman Colum. Membership of arbitration task forces and committees are also now much more diverse than they used to be. And importantly, diversity is something that's taken into account when putting groups together to ensure a diverse range of views and perspectives are represented. I will mention these in more detail later in the debate, but it's also worth noting here that it's thankfully now rare to see an all-male panel at an arbitration conference or event. And anecdotal evidence suggests that lists of all male arbitrator candidates being sent to clients are also much less common than they used to be. Finally, I note that over the last five years, the conversation has shifted from why gender diversity is important to how it can be implemented. So to wrap up, the evidence clearly shows that there's been significant progress made in recent years towards greater gender diversity in international arbitration. This is largely a result of the vast array of initiatives that have spotlighted the issue and sought to address it. These include Arbitral Women, the ERA Pledge, the ICA Task Force on Gender Diversity, Meet Off Thursdays, which recently won the Pledge Award for Best Development for Gender Diversity, and various regional, regional networks that exist, including Women in Way in Arbitration, LATAM, and the Russian Women in Arbitration Group, as well as many more. Thanks, Louise. Thank you, Ashley, and you stayed within your five minutes. Uh, Jen, I'm turning to you now. Um, Tell us, how effective are these existing initiatives and what more is needed? Thank you, Louise. Um, and thank you to the AIAC for hosting today, today's debate on such an important topic. Um, so today, I will argue that the arbitration community is still charting the way um, on gender diversity. Progress has been made. Um, I'll acknowledge that. However, there is so much more that we can do in the field. Now, Ashley discusses statistics that are now available on gender diversity that were not previously available or collated as of, you know, five, 10 years ago. She also discussed how those statistics have improved since 2016 in particular. Now, the available data, however, is insufficient, um, and it also may paint a rosier picture than in fact exists. So with respect to the appointment of women as arbitrators, um, and as Louise, in fact, mentioned in her introduction to this debate, one of the largest gaps that we have concerns repeat appointments. So a large number of repeat appointments um, would tend to reduce the true diversity of appointees, um, or at the very least would obscure the extent to which women are given their first opportunity um, to sit as arbitrators. In a survey conducted by PCAD in 2019, for example, the 25 top female arbitrators in investor state cases had received a total of 314 appointments. Of these, however, 179 appointments, or 57%, were of just two women arbitrators. And 76% of those appointments were of just six arbitrators. So while you have a few select women in the investment arbitration field, just as an example, who have made it as arbitrators and who have gotten to the highest echelons of the field, um, there is so much more work that is left to be done to expand that pool and enhance opportunities for women. 
Another gap in the data is the type of case, as Louise again mentioned. Are women being appointed more frequently to disputes involving smaller claims as compared to the male counterparts? Are they being appointed more to treaty versus contract claims? And similarly, what is the role to which women are being appointed? Are women actually being appointed as president of tribunals or do they tend to be appointed as co-arbitrators? Are they being appointed as sole arbitrators? This kind of data is not available and it skews any increases that we currently see in the gender diversity um, field at the moment. What else is missing? Um, we also don't have much information on first time appointees. It would be quite useful to know how many men versus women receive their first appointment as an arbitrator in any given year, and whether the proportion of women receiving their first appointment has increased. A final factor um, that affects not just first-time appointees, but also more generally, is information on law firm policies. We know that some law firms have policies that prohibit or limit partners from accepting appointments as arbitrators while simultaneously acting as counsel at the law firm. And while such policies would affect men and women equally, it would be useful to know the extent to which those policies have a greater effect on men versus women. Without this data, it's extraordinarily difficult to determine whether there in fact has been the progress that Ashley has just discussed. And further to this point, I would note that the data alone is not sufficient. Rather, it's the first step towards identifying the trends, pinpointing the issues, and then taking steps to fix those problems. And just briefly, Ashley had mentioned other evidence of enhanced diversity. And while progress has been made, the fact that there is an increase in the proportions of gender diversity does not mean that we can now sit back and rest on our laurels. For example, while nearly half of associates and law firms in the United States are women, less than 20% of equity partners are women. With respect to the appointment of arbitrators, while the data does show an increase in the number of female appointments, only 21% of appointed arbitrators in 2019 were women. And while this is better than in 2015, we are very far from achieving 50-50 gender parity in appointments of arbitrators. And then finally, Ashley mentioned um, how it was front page news when in March of this year, um, or sorry, when earlier this week, um, Claudia Solomon made headlines um, when she began her term as president of the ICC International Court of Arbitration as the first woman president in the court's nearly 100 year history. And then earlier this year as well, um, we saw headlines about the chairman of the ICSID Administrative Council appointing an all-female ad hoc committee in an annulment proceeding um, to consider an award that, by the way, had been rendered by an all-male panel. Um, indisputably, these are substantial achievements. They're important, they're significant. Um, but in my view, diversity will only have been achieved when such events, um, the appointment of a woman to a key organization, or the appointment of a all-female tribunal. Um, you know, we only have diversity when those things don't make headlines, when those things are common occurrences that occur day by day. Um, so in conclusion, um, while progress certainly has been made, um, there is so much more to be done and the arbitration community cannot just sit back um, and think that we have achieved diversity um, in the field. Thank you, Jen. Now, turning to ethnic and geographic diversity, Daniel, can you talk to us about how successful we've been at tackling ethnic and geographic diversity? Thanks, Louise. Uh, in favor of the proposition, I will be arguing that the current efforts of the arbitration community has successfully charted the way to achieve ethnic and geographic diversity in international arbitration. Um, I, I think that to start, I confess it is quite difficult to measure success in what is no doubt an ongoing work in progress to achieve true diversity and inclusion in our field. Clearly, there is a great deal more to do, but we should also take stock of what has been done in the field and how that has contributed to increased ethnic and geographic diversity in international arbitration. So I think a preliminary question is this. At this stage where there is still clearly some lack of diversity in uh, ethnic and geographic uh, factors, what do we mean when we say success? 
it's difficult to say whether this should be measured in some absolute numerical benchmark or some other measure. Now, I won't pretend to know what complete diversity and inclusivity should look like. But when I think about measuring success in tackling lack of diversity, I thought what it means to strive for diversity and what has been done to strive for that goal. So to me, striving for true diversity in our field is challenging the race and color, and the region dominance, gender, and so on. And taking steps of diversity and taking steps to uh, ethnic and diversity, I think that is contributing to measure success. So to my mind, we have- Excuse me, Daniel, I'm going to interrupt you for a moment. You'll be given extra time. In a number of uh, ways. Daniel, uh, we're having a hard time uh, with the audio, with Can your you audio. You uh, it's, uh, it's very difficult to understand. There's an echo. Is there someone in the room that has a- um, Another- So sorry. I, I, I've, got, I've got a slump, uh, set of headphones. So sorry about that. Okay. You, you won't lose time, but thank you very much for trying to. Let's see if that's better. Is this better now? Yes, it is. Thank you. All right. So sorry about that. So uh, as I mentioned before, to my mind, I think we have been quite successful in tackling ethnic and geographic diversity in a number of ways. So the first is the increasing participation of grassroots movements within the international arbitration space, whose specific emphasis is on promoting ethnic and geographic diversity. For example, last year, the Racial Equality for Arbitration Lawyers, or RAIL for short, was established with the aim of enhancing access to international arbitration and international law fields for everyone, regardless of race. Uh, it also aims to build awareness about the current lack of racial diversity in international arbitration, to create a platform for addressing systemic discrimination and implicit bias in international arbitration, and also to create a safe space for members of underrepresented groups to discuss the challenges they face without any inhibition. And before that, in 2018, we had the Alliance for Equality and Dispute Resolution, which was launched to it, uh, with the aim of promoting inclusivity in all aspects of the dispute resolution world and striving for equality of opportunity, regardless of nationality, location, ethnicity, gender, or age. And it has a specific focus on addressing the lack of diversity in relation to ethnicity and geography in international arbitration. And it does so through training, mentoring, and access to online discussion forums. Now, the common goal of these two um, grassroots movements, which I uh, mentioned, is to offset the social economic limitations that young practitioners from underrepresented groups may experience when entering the field and creating a more level playing field. It will do this through offering them scholarships, fellowships and awards and running mentorship schemes for um, underrepresented groups as well. The second point I'd like to make is that the increasing awareness and appreciation of the values of diversity amongst users of international arbitration is becoming well recorded. Institutional stakeholders recognize the value of diversity in tribunals. We must not forget that international arbitration does retain its attraction to its users, in large part due to it being a party-driven system defined by its users' wants and needs. And the perception is that parties have traditionally preferred repeat appointments and are not interested in trying out new arbitrators. However, if you look at successive surveys of the Queen Mary University, uh, it shows that calls for a larger and more diverse pool of candidates have constantly increased throughout the years. For example, if we were to look at the 2018 International Arbitration Survey conducted by Queen Mary University of London and Whiting Case, when asked whether there are any causal relationships between diversity across a multi-member tribunal and the quality of its decision-making, the most popular answer chosen by a quarter of respondents was that the effect of diversity across a panel of arbitrators on the quality of that tribunal's decision-making depends very much on the particularities of the dispute in question. 22% of respondents also say that diversity brings out some improvement in quality, while 18% of respondents take the view that diversity leads to a significant improvement in quality. Now, a similar number of about 19% of respondents deemed this inquiry to be quite irrelevant. Now, they did so because they considered diversity to be inherently valuable in and of itself. The views that diversity does not make an appreciable difference in quality or can even reduce the quality of decision-making were less adhered to. This shows that, that although there is a very diverse view on diversity, and this includes diversity on ethnicity and geography, uh, there is overall a uniformly positive approach to diversity. 
Third, there is ongoing efforts by arbitral institutions to improve diversity and remove traditional barriers to the appointment of arbitrators, uh, including on ethnic and geographic grounds. The arbitration process may sometimes pose certain specific challenges and opportunities for diversity. Bear in mind that there are still arbitration agreements uh, in contracts which specifically bar individuals from acting as arbitrators where they share the same nationality with any of the disputing parties. With respect to nationality, there are still statutes in countries and certain arbitration institutions which provide that absent an agreement to the contrary by the parties, the chair or the sole arbitrator should not have the same nationality of either party. The exit rules also pose similar limitations, but these are largely owed to traditional schools of thought which advocate for the appearance of neutrality given the nature of investment arbitration proceedings. But apart from these, I think model arbitration clauses in arbitration institutions around the world no longer include such wordings or limitations. The practice of many arbitration institutions today is also to seek to expand the geographical representation of the pool of appointed arbitrators and the pool of panel of arbitrators. So it becomes more reflective of human diversity. Now, I, I see that my time is coming to an end, but in closing, I will say this. There has not yet been a measure uh, equal to Gary Benton's proposed defective panel standard, which advocates that all panels should include at least one woman or other diverse practitioner, and panels that do not are deemed to be def defective panels. However, there have been clear signs of an increased focus on the pro problems of lack of ethnic and geographic diversity in international arbitration, and there have been steps taken to address them. And in this way, I think that the international arbitration community has been successful in charting the way. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. And now we turn to Lillian. Lillian, what, what's not right? Where do we have to go from here? Thank you, Louis. Like all most of the participants today, I think there are multiple gaps to the current initiative. And for the next four and a half minutes, I make four proposals to which I think may be worthwhile considering in the course of our journey to increase ethnic or geographic diversity. Two proposals deal with the roles of arbitral institution. I'm happy we have representatives from arbitral institution today. And the other two apply to the arbitration community as a whole. First, administrating institutions should deploy specific mechanisms to increase transparency in their selection criteria. These bodies may also want to take a more proactive role in encouraging parties to commit to diversity. There is detailed information disclosed in respect of how institutions choose arbitrators, whether they actively take diversity into consideration along with merits, and if so, how do they do it? The 2020 exit data show that from a total of 211 appointments, arbitrators from Western Europe and North America, Canada, US, and Mexico accounted for about 60%, whilst Eastern Europe and Central Asia only had four appointments, not 4%, but four appointments. The London Code of International Arbitration, LCIA, published its report two months ago. 63% from the total appointment consists of British arbitrators. How many from that 63% British arbitrators are arbitrators from the Black, Asian, and minority ethnic group? We don't know. From the remaining 37% of appointments, the LCIA reported they were from 40 different countries, the highest numbers being arbitrators from Canada, US, Ireland, Germany, Mexico. Again, how many from that 37% consists of arbitrations from the um, minority ethnic group, Black, Asians? We don't know. Coming back to today's questions, are we still charting the way? The answer is affirmative. As Daniel suggested, it is difficult to measure success. Even the data is unable to tell us whether we have progress, and if so, how? To answer the second part of Louis' question, what else can we do? For institutional appointment, institution may take a proactive role by encouraging parties to commit to a fair representation of diverse candidates as one of their selection criteria. This does not affect the party's autonomy in choosing their arbitrator. Second, institution may want to consider how they can better project their panelists by focusing on professional quality, like experience, areas of expertise, before other demographic characteristics come into play. I'm targeting the search tool. For example, the ICC search function allows users to select which nationality they want to search for arbitrators. No option to shortlist candidates based on their areas of expertise. No CVs are publicly available, or at least not that I can find. So nationality appears to be a focus for the institution to project their panel. 
when a platform is designed that manner, the first thing that comes to a researcher mind or a junior that is asked to search for candidates is what nationality should I select before I consider any other factors? That, in no doubt, will limit the scope of the pools of arbitrators the researcher may come up with. Institution may want to reconsider generating more selection criteria in their search tool in that regard. For my third point, I propose the centralized arbitrators profiling website. So instead of relying on institutions to provide information about arbitrators, having a centralized profiling website may allow the arbitrators to publish their CV, the information they want to project, and this will resolve issues often faced by counsel that I don't know who else I can select because I only know those names that I frequently dealt with. Then, if there is a common pool with a database of qualified arbitrators in different jurisdictions covering different areas, something perhaps akin to a legal database search engine like LexisNexis or Westlaw, wouldn't that make it easier for practitioners or clients to consider more ethnically and geographically diverse arbitrators apart from those that they already knew? The other idea I would like to explore is blind selection. It's not a stranger's term when it comes to hiring process. But when it comes to arbitration, we don't see that being implemented. Legal counsel is the gatekeeper for their clients when it comes to recommendation of arbitrators. More often than not, counsel, we recommend people that we know. And as a result, we don't explore other candidates which may be equally competent and diverse. So a blind selection means you put forward a list of arbitrators with their credentials, experience, you remove characteristics which would identify their nationality or ethnicity. This idea has been implemented, as I say, in hiring, but we have not seen that being expanded in arbitration. Using this mechanism, perhaps you know, one shortlist a pool of arbitrators based on merits, then you consider the secondary requirements you or your client has. Lastly, I conclude by restating the position that clearly there is more to be done. There is a lack of statistics on ethnic diversity. The present search tool online is not designed to encourage or to make it easier for parties or legal counsel in their research for arbitrators from diverse ethnic or geographical backgrounds. That, no doubt, hinders the process for us in charting the way. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Lillian. Now, turning to our second topic, um, the question I'd like to put um, to the uh, to Jen is, what are the barriers to achieving more gender diversity on tribunals? Thanks, Louise. There unfortunately are numerous barriers to achieving more gender diversity on arbitral tribunals. These barriers often are categorized into two separate types, um, and that's what I'd like to do in my discussion today as well. So first, I want to look at the limitations on the availability of sufficiently experienced female arbitrators, which has been referred to as leaks in the pipeline. And then second, I'll look at impediments to the appointment of already experienced female arbitrators, known as plugs in the pipeline. So turning first to the leaks, namely the barriers to women gaining sufficient experience to be considered as and appointed as candidates um, to arbitral tribunals. One of the primary leaks is the retention of women in the workplace. Now, we all know that this is a problem. Um, I think it's pretty common knowledge that associates in law firms tend to be pretty equal in gender parity. Um, but by the time you get to equity partner, especially, those numbers have dwindled. Um, and while this is particularly the case at law firms where you can compare the number of associates with the number of partners or equity partners, um, you also see it in other areas of the field. And if we're going to address diversity in appointees to tribunals, we first need to ensure that women are achieving senior roles at law firms and also at other institutions. Relatedly, there's a lack of flexible arrangements in the workplace in many countries. And this is particularly the case in international arbitration, where at least prior to the pandemic, um, the nature of the job requires frequent travel. Even today, significant time is still spent devoted to hearings, even if you're not traveling, um, as well as to filings. And there is significant pressure resulting from the high stakes nature of the job. Flexible arrangements can assist um, in addressing these issues, but there's a long way to go. 
In addition, women also tend to have children and thus go on maternity leave uh, during the years of their career when they may start to be appointed as arbitrators. This delays when they may get that crucial first appointment as an arbitrator and then set them back as compared to their male counterparts. Another leak is the impact of unconscious bias. In a 2019 survey by the Law Society of England and Wales, for example, over half of the 7,700 respondents saw unconscious bias as the main barrier to women progressing their careers in law. Unconscious bias also is reflected in the gender pay gap. In that same Law Society study in 2019, over 60% of respondents were aware of a gender pay gap organ of a gender pay gap uh, within their organizations. And then finally, harassment and bullying. It's a problem that unfortunately remains and generally has a greater effect on women as compared to men. And although more attention has been paid to the issue in the, frequent, in the last several years as a result of the Me Too movement, um, it still remains an issue and prohibits women from advancing their careers. Now, moving on to the plugs in the pipeline, um, meaning the impediments to the appointment of already experienced female arbitrators. One issue is that diversity um, generally tends to be pretty low on the list of priorities when particularly counsel and perhaps co-arbitrators are looking into the appointment of a particular arbitrator for a case. Counsel, um, for example, often rely on word of mouth, as Lillian mentioned earlier. Um, they rely on other factors. They're not looking specifically, let's retain a woman to um, be our arbitrator. They're looking at the other factors involved. Again, there's an impact of unconscious bias. Um, nominating parties and counsel often are inclined to appoint someone who they believe protects gravitas, or more specifically, um, an image of gravitas with which they're familiar. And in most cases, that's a man. There's also an affinity bias by which individuals are more likely to appoint someone who is like them in terms of appearance, beliefs, and background. So then you get a perpetuating problem of men appointing other men. There also is an undeniable aversion to appointing first timers. Um, and so for both men and women, you need someone to take a chance on you to give you that first appointment. Um, and as a woman, the likelihood of getting that first appointment may be decreased by things like unconscious bias and the other factors I just discussed. And then finally, we also have limited access to information about qualified female candidates. And Lillian just discussed this in terms of race and in geography, um, but this is also true with respect to women. And this severely limits the pool of those who may be considered as arbitrators um, and prevents arbitration users from accessing sufficient information about qualified women candidates. So in conclusion, these leaks and plugs um, really prevent gender equality in the appointment of arbitrators. And there is no overnight fix to these issues. Um, the arbitration community thus needs to continue to chart the way in addressing these barriers. Thank you, Jen. Well, speaking of addressing the barriers, Ashley, I'll turn to you and ask you what needs to happen over the next couple of years to uh, make sure that we do progress gender diversity on tribunals. Thank you. Um, so in my response to this question, um, I will describe how the barriers outlined by uh, Jennifer um, are being and can in future be overcome by the arbitration community thanks to the existing measures and initiatives in place. First, I will address the pipeline leak. Although, as Jen mentioned, there are insufficient female partners in law firms currently, this number is nevertheless increasing, and this trend should continue as law firms focus on the issue and set ambitious targets. Law firms and other organisations now expressly and publicly recognise the importance of diversity and are doing much more than previously to address it. Diversity is not now not just the right thing to do, but it's a business imperative. Further, certain clients are now requiring diversity as part of the pitch process for selection of arbitration counsel, which is helping to focus law firm efforts in this regard. The negative impact of unconscious bias is now widely accepted and many law firms have adopted measures to combat its effect internally. 
for example, requiring senior members of the team to complete training programmes. Anecdotally, law firms appear to be increasingly embracing more flexible working arrangements that will hopefully result in more people, men and women, being able to organise their lives around work and family commitments in a way that suits them, rather than being bound by the traditional ways of working, needing to be seen in the office five days a week and face time being rewarded. Over time, these changes will hopefully result in more female and diverse partners being made up as the traditional barriers, um, including unconscious bias, lack of flexible working, um, et cetera, mentioned by Jen, continue to be challenged and lifted. Turning next to the so-called plugs, i.e. the barriers preventing equally qualified female arbitrators from getting appointments. There is no doubt that there already exists a large pool of talented female arbitrator candidates. The key is ensuring that this pool of talent is being fully utilised and, can, and female candidates are appointed on an equal opportunity basis. I believe that we are beyond the stage when it's acceptable to put forward non-diverse lists of candidates with no or a token woman. As Jen mentioned, until we reach numerical equality, um, it is vital that diversity is one of the criteria taken into account when compiling lists of arbitrator candidates. Otherwise, the danger is the same few male names that the law firm partner has seen before are rolled out again and again. Many of the arbitral institutions that have made progress in terms of gender diversity over the last few years have done so by making a conscious decision to look beyond those well-known names and where necessary to do the additional research required to find equally qualified female candidates. Law firms are now starting to do the same and many more sources of information exist to help find female arbitrators compared to what was previously available. Through the annual GAR 100 questionnaire, law firms are asked to report on the percentage of female arbitrators they have appointed over the research window. This and other initiatives such as the um, German Arbitration Institute Era Pledge Gender Champion Project are using statistical self-monitoring to encourage law firms to put gender high on, higher on the list of priorities in the arbitrator selection process. Law firms are coming up with their own ideas too. At Freshfields, for example, we maintain a female arbitrator database to assist with the search process. Also, um, other tools exist. Via the ERA Pledge Arbitrator Search function, users can also seek assistance in finding female arbitrator candidates meeting their requisite criteria if they've been unable to find them from any other sources. Profile raising and increasing the visibility of female arbitrators is also key. Thankfully, and contrary to the position a few years ago, as I mentioned earlier, it's now very rare to see an arbitration conference or event with an all-male panel or so-called manal. Organisers of events are much more aware and recognise the need to include a fair representation of women in their speaker lineups. I'm also aware of members of the arbitration community that will refuse to speak at or attend conferences that don't meet their minimum standards of diversity and inclusion in terms of speakers. Individuals and organisations that signed the ERA pledge committed to ensure that panels contain a fair representation of women. Additionally, the ICC signed a, for example, signed a gender balance pledge, an internal document in 2018, to publicly commit to increase gender diversity in panel discussions in which the ICC participates. The statistics I mentioned earlier show that the institutions are leading the way in terms of appointing a fair representation of women. In some cases, such as the LCIA, SCC and DIS, their recent figures show that they're already achieving gender parity in their own appointments. However, as we have heard, further progress is needed with respect to party and co-arbitrator appointments. Law firms and barrister chambers have an important role in advising clients, the parties to the arbitration, on the arbitration selection process. Although it's difficult to monitor, over 500 law firms and chambers have signed the ERA pledge, pursuant to which they commit to include a fair representation of female candidates in lists of potential arbitrators or chairs. Anecdotally, I'm aware of law firms, including Freshfields, updating their policies to reflect this commitment of an, and of clients who are sending back lists of arbitrator candidates that not, do not contain sufficient women. Another key element to continuing to overcome these barriers lies with mobilizing and empowering the next generation of arbitrators and arbitrator appointers. Arguably, the younger generation is already much more enlightened and aware of diversity and less likely to fall foul to unconscious bias. Thanks to the great work being done by young arbitration groups, um, such as the Young Arbitral Women Practitioners, Pledge Young Practitioners Subcommittee, the Rising Arbitrator Initiative, Young ICA, et cetera. There are a wealth of opportunities and resources at the fingertips of young lawyers to build the valuable skills and professional contacts required to be a successful arbitrator and give them support for raising their profiles and reputations. 
So to finish, I believe that the um, but barriers described by Jennifer, notably the leaks and plugs in the pipeline of arbitrators, are already being challenged and steadily overcome by the existing initiatives and efforts in place to address them. Thank you, Ashley. On the topic of ethnic and geographic diversity, uh, what, uh, Lily, and I'll ask you this, uh, what's currently being done to achieve more ethnic and geographical diversity on tribunals? Uh, the biggest barrier, I, I believe, is actually the fact that many don't even recognize it as a problem. I did a short survey for the purposes of today's debate. One third of the respondents whom I've interviewed stated they have not heard of the concept of breaking the glass ceiling. In case some of the participants are not familiar with this phrase, the term is often used to describe an invincible systematic barrier that prevents minorities from advancing in their career, could be due to their gender, ethnicity, or other factors. That is not surprising. I would like to focus my discussion on the Southeast Asian region. We see some, but minimal support to promote ethnic or geographic diversity within the legal fraternity. After all, we are more commonly known as slave drivers, busy pitching for deals and strategizing our case than as a advocate of human rights. While then some believe there might be some truth with it, I will pause for a second here, that's stereotyping. And stereotyping is one hurdle we are facing. The irony is that most organizations that promote diversity are those in the Western countries. Coming back to the question today, are we charting the way in achieving diversity? Clearly not there yet. You can't proceed if people don't even recognize it as an issue to be addressed. The, the second issues or obstacle I rather want to discuss is unconscious bias as discussed by both Ashley and Jen, Jennifer earlier but I will focus more on ethnicity. How does that affect ethnic diversity? We have heard that many institutions actively seeking to appoint arbitrators from diverse backgrounds. However, we are still far from achieving diversity in the international arbitration community. Why? Many believe that it is the parties who resist change. I think there is some truth in it. It is the mindset that we are having taking Caucasian arbitrators as the minority and non-Caucasian as the, uh, sorry, as the majority and non-Caucasian as the minority, a common mindset for many from the majority and the minority is that whatever relates to international, it is the Caucasian territory. Caucasian is also sometimes perceived to be better or more experienced. This is not an easy topic. Many consider it as sensitive, especially in this part of the continent. So are there people with diverse background, which may be equally competent, if not better than the few top names that are common to the legal fraternity? Perhaps, but we are not able to introduce someone we don't know unless we are committed to make a conscious effort. So conscious effort is something that I would like to focus or emphasize to the participants today. It is easy to start in the comfort zone, but difficult to charter into a stranger's territory. That is one further we have to overcome. Apart from unconscious bias that exists in the legal community, commercial bias or fear or unfamiliarity is another issue. Decision makers, more often than not, they are the senior management in organization. Whilst most of the corporation commit to be all inclusive in their hiring process, little emphasis is placed on diversity when it comes to selection of legal counsel or arbitral appointment. We all want to select a qualified candidate, the, be the best candidate. But we have to realize that qualified arbitrators are in the majority pool, which in this context, for the purpose of today's discussion, the, the, the Caucasian, or some people like to term it as the white, as well as the minority pool, Black Asians or other minority groups. The barrier in the commercial reality is that even if the management is provided with a candidate list that includes diverse candidates, more often than not, they prefer candidates with similar cultural backgrounds. This approach predominantly results in the selection of the typical saying, older white male arbitrators. The other issue or hurdle rather is the fear of acknowledging the issue of taking a part in diversity movement. Barrier exists at the entry level. How to be diversified if ethnic minorities can't even get into the game? There are significantly lesser diversity movements activity in non-Western countries. What is stopping us? Many, many states believe that 
we struggle to escape the past. When it comes to gender diversity, people are more open these days to discuss the topic in the public. In the country, Malaysia, where I am from, many still consider ethnicity as a sensitive topic and, and rather avoid it. Hence, reaching out to the minority and getting the minority to acknowledge the issue is key. From the speaker's perspective, I think the AIAC did well in this session by having me, as I would say, I, I represent the minority in the sense that in the sense that before this, I did not give much attention to this topic. And I believe this is the same for my peers, who some of them are present as attendees today. I myself learned in this process when I bounce ideas off my learned colleagues, Ashley, Jennifer, Daniel, and share my thoughts with Louise. They are sharing on pipeline, pipeline plugs and pipeline leaks is something I can tell you I'm heard of by, by, by many of my peers. I will end my session by answering the question posed today whether the barriers or what is being done, is, 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 it, is it difficult? Is it too great to be overcome? Reality tell us that this won't be easy. That's why we are here doing this diversity in arbitration week, which is also an NIAC annual initiative to reach out. Hopefully people will believe that if they create opportunities for diversity, diversity will in turn create opportunities for them. Thank you. Thank you, Lillian. Now to Daniel. How effective are these, cur these current efforts in overcoming the obstacles? Thanks, Louis. Uh, now, this, is, this is no doubt a tricky topic, I think. Well, when we consider ethnic and geographic diversity, it differs depending on the geography involved and the ethnicity involved. The reality is that geographical considerations had in the past been a fairly important consideration in selecting arbitrators. Of course, I mean this was uh, before the COVID pandemic had come. Ethnic considerations, on the other hand, relating to language and culture, often do present themselves to be important issues in arbitration, uh, arbitrations which tend to have a more domestic focus, especially in circumstances where the dispute is between uh, domestic parties of similar nationalities. The reality is that the conf confidential nature of arbitration and the opaque appointment process limits the available information from which parties and arbitral institutions can identify and screen potential arbitrators. This reduces the visibility of diverse, of diverse candidates. Too often, the selection of arbitral candidates involves looking at arbitral institutions' lists, business cards, word of mouth, a process which perpetuates appointments of ultimately the same faces. So a key focus in surmounting barriers to achieving ethnogeographic diversity in the appointment of arbitrators' efforts include the problem of information bottleneck. Newer and more diverse arbitrators cannot readily develop international reputations as long as personal pref uh, references are the primary means for determining expertise and efficiency. This informational bottleneck is increasingly intolerable in light of concerns about the lack of ethnic and geographic diversity amongst international arbitrators. Now, this all comes despite in-house counsel often having corporate benchmarks to find newer, more diverse service providers, which would also include arbitrators, except for the fact that sometimes there is scarcity of information in relation to diverse arbitral appointments. Now, a lot have, has been said about the statistics of the appointment of Anglo-European arbitrators and the lack of appointments amongst Black, Asian and minority ethnic groups and the current state to search them. Lillian has covered that very well. That is the state of the data and it is what it is, currently at least. But therein lies the key, data. Now, if we think about success as being the steps taken to tear down barriers to diversity, we think of efficacy as how we have manage to tear down barriers to diversity, then it should follow that with more data available to users of arbitration, the more information we have to be aware of. And with more information, the more able we are to take positive action on the barriers to ethnic and, and geographic diversity. The key is to reduce any bias, unconscious or otherwise, in favor of Anglo-European arbitrators, or put it differently, any unconscious bias against arbitrators of non-Anglo-European backgrounds. So in a clue arbitration blog post at the end of 2017, Professor Catherine Rogers articulated that the paradox of the paradox that public consensus increasingly reflects a pervasive concern about the lack of diversity amongst international practitioners, but there is an apparent failure to translate the concern into appointments for women or even other diverse practitioners. Now, Professor Rogers argues that the key to unlocking the paradox is better intelligence on arbitrators, of course, Professor Rogers is right. More information is needed to identify qualified arbitrators and thereafter implement change. 
data science has made its entry into the world of international arbitration, offering tools that may help to correct the ethnic and geographic diversity deficit in an effective manner. Online databases using data analytics do exist, and some of them are already attempting to bridge the transparency gap in the arbitrator selection process. For example, Prof, uh, Professor Rogers created the platform Arbitrator Intelligence, which is dedicated to encouraging diversity by providing diverse arbitrators with greater visibility in the community and the people that appoint them. At the end of each arbitration, parties and their counsel are urged to complete an Arbitrator Intelligence questionnaire. Arbitrator Intelligence then aggregates biographical information about various arbitrators, as well as statistics related to past decisions, such as the claimant's rate of recovery, with the aim of providing reports about arbitrators that can then be purchased by counsel and third party funders. It aims to promote diversity effectively by increasing information and reducing subjectivity in the arbitrator selection process. According to Professor Rogers, more information allows newer arbitrators to be more fairly compared to experienced arbitrators based on the objective criteria available and would help overcome the opacity in the process I described earlier. Similarly, other data tools include GAR's Arbitrator Research Tool, which aims to deliver insight and raw data on arbitrators and lets users uh, search for arbitrators through various filters. Applying artificial intelligence to enhance the data analytics element of a usual database by trawling through a vast amount of data to suggest the best candidate or most suitable candidate for a particular case based on parties' stated preferences therefore appear to be the next logical next, uh, step in the development of such technology in a way to effectively deal with the barriers to appointment of um, uh, di diverse arbitrators. Now, for the time being, there is more robust methods to further the quest for diversity on tribunals than to impose limits on the choice of arbitrators by reference to diversity quotas. We have seen, uh, I, I've mentioned earlier about the uh, use of data analytics, but Ultimately, the focus is currently on educating users that a diverse tribunal may in many cases be the better fit for their case rather than forcing new candidates upon them. Time will tell whether the current efforts and the um, information gap that is sought to be uh, filled would ultimately bear fruit and lead to more efficient and effective efforts to uh, tear down the barriers to ethnically and geographically diverse arbitrator appointments. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Well, that concludes this part of our discussion, and it now falls to one member of each team to give us a one minute synthesis of your positions. So we'll start with the affirmative side. Who's going to do that? I'll be handling that argument. Jen, all right, you have a minute. Thank you. So as Lily and I, Lillian and I have explained over the course of the debate, there remain significant challenges to achieving diversity in arbitration. We certainly have not achieved diversity at this stage. So first, the current data on gender, racial, and geographic diversity is insufficient. Um, and gaps in what data we have may obscure our understanding of what truly is happening in the field. While a light certainly has been shined in diversity, um, particularly gender diversity in recent years, we cannot be complacent and we must continue to strive to achieve gender uh, parity and racial and ethnic parity as well. All actors in arbitration, including in particular law firms and arbitral institutions, must take more and stronger measures to address the continued problem. What is currently out there is not enough. And then second, we discussed today substantial barriers that exist to achieving diversity, including the retention of minorities in the profession, the significant effect of unconscious bias, acknowledgement of the problem of diversity in the first place, particularly racial and geographic diversity, and also limited access to information on qualified diverse candidates to arbitral tribunals. So all of these factors currently serve to prevent the arbitration community from reaching true diversity in um, appointments and in the field more generally. Existing initiatives are not sufficient um, and the arbitration community must continue to make a very conscious effort to address diversity going forward. Thank you. And who's going to do the one minute synthesis on behalf of the negative team? I am. So to summarize the case for, for Daniel and, and my side of the debate, um, namely that the arbitration community have 
charted the way in, uh, to achieving gender diversity um, and diversity is, is flourishing um, in, the, uh, in the arbitration community. Um, what we've heard today um, is that the arbitration community has made significant strides in recent years to improving diversity. We may not have reached numerical equality in either gender, geographical or ethnic diversity, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean diversity isn't flourishing. Um, we have explained um, why uh, we have started to chart the way through the collective efforts of many, many, many initiatives and people um, to pave the way for barriers to be challenged and lifted over time um, for diversity to be achieved. The statistical and anecdotal progress that we discussed that we've seen in recent years will continue and the existing bar barriers um, will be overcome. Diversity is now recognized as being inherently valuable and accepted, which is a huge milestone. So specifically the progress that has been made by arbitral institutions, especially with respect to first time appointments is paving the way for broader diversity in all appointments as the pool of experienced arbitrators expands and diversifies. Diversity has become a business imperative and the benefits that diversity brings to the system of arbitration um, are without doubt. It will take time, but the opportunity is there for the diverse array of talent that exists in the arbitration community to flourish and for diversity to be achieved over the next few years. Thank you, Ashley, and congratulations to all four of our debaters for your very thorough and convincing arguments. And uh, now the time has come to uh, do our exit poll to see how many people have been persuaded uh, and so can we have the poll, please? Irene, there. Same question. How many people have changed their mind? There is approximately 30 seconds left to vote. I can tell for this one poll, people are starting to contemplate because I've seen how the bar moves and it's slightly slower this time. Okay, then I will end the poll now and share the results. Ah, well. We have, <laughs> there's a change in the test poll. There's been a definite, there's been a definite shift there. Wonderful. Well, again, thank you very much to the speakers. Now we do have a few minutes left and uh, I'd like to open the floor now to questions and comments from the floor and also um, the, the speakers, if they'd like to uh, join in those comments, either in answering questions or making additional brief comments, of course, um, please feel free to do so. There is um, a question from the Q&A, which I could start with. Um, do you accept someone in their late forties to be an arbitrator with no legal background and no experience in arbitration? And what can we do to be accepted? I guess this is from someone who doesn't have a legal background and doesn't have experience in arbitration, uh, asking whether they have a possibility of being appointed. Who wants to take that? Perhaps I will just share what Elliot? I know. Yeah, perhaps i just share what I know. I, I think there are um, accreditation or, or training programs of across different jurisdictions and different countries, they, they may assist, assist the, the, the person who has asked the question. Um, one of them that I know would be the Charter Institute of Arbitration, uh, arbitration Charter, 
the CR, Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. And in Malaysia, you have the Malaysian branch, Malaysian Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. You can go to their website. They do offer a lot of accreditation programs. I'm happy other chip in their view. So uh, educate yourself in the field so that you've got the basis, the, the knowledge base. Any other answers to that question? I would just add that, um, you know, get your name out there. I think that's so important. And we talk a lot about that in the, um, the ICA task force report, which relates to gender, but really applies um, to anyone looking to get into the arbitration and arbitrator field. Um, you know, you don't have to have the legal background. Um, but get your name out there. Go to the arbitral institutions. Tell them that you're interested in getting an appointment. Um, make clear that you have expertise in a certain industry or that you have a certain language skill set. Um, you also can go to conferences like this, um, you know, meet counsel, um, meet potential parties to an arbitration. Um, so I think getting your name out there um, in order to get that first appointment is, is crucial um, in breaking in. Um, there's another question, and that is, uh, will we get marginalized and looked down on in the, in the circle of elite arbitrators? And I guess this is people who feel, this is probably someone who uh, feels that they are looking for someone to give them their first opportunity or to um, choose them when they have, uh, uh, are not normally going to be chosen for, for a large or important case, for example. Um, is there a danger of the diversity movement um, creating this marginalization? Anybody want to deal with that? I may not um, have the answer because I myself am not in the circle of elite arbitrators, but, but I would just like to share um, some thoughts that I have in the course of my research and preparing for, for this debate. This, this actually, this issue or this matter did come out in, in those materials that I've read. Um, a lot of people, or it seems to be a perception of perhaps those that are not in the arbitration community, community or they are rather junior in the community, they seem to think that arbitrators are arbitrations or arbitrators are those that are for the majority, for the better one or for the elite. Um, I, I don't know if, if there is a solution to that or, or whether it goes back to the, the measures that, that we have discussed, actually, Jennifer and Daniel have discussed about what you can do to close the back gaps or to minimize it. Uh, so this is just, just some of the thoughts that I have. Any other comments on that question? I was just going to say that I think, you know, this is kind of classic sort of imposter syndrome, um, which I think is, you know, it is a big, um, a big issue. Um, um, and sort of, you know, issues of kind of social mobility and, and other things, you know, raise similar similar issues. But I think you know, everyone has to start somewhere. Um, even the elite arbitrators had to get their first appointment at some point. Um, and I think, you know, you recognizing that you can have a lot to offer without necessarily having kind of arbit experience sitting as an arbitrator. Um, uh, which obviously, once you've got your first appointment, then you you can you can build on that experience. But you know, everyone's got to get their first appointment, and it's about sort of finding ways um, to, as Jen said, sort of get your name out there um, with the institutions, um, council, other people in in who, who sort of make make the decisions and and come up with the lists of of arbitrator candidates, um, and that can be quite difficult. But you know, I think having the the kind of confidence to to sort of go for that um, is um, is important and, and uh, I think there are you know there's quite a lot of sort of webinars and, and talks and conferences and things you can go to now that can sort of give you sort of skills on kind of building that sort of confidence and um, ability to sort of you know draft your CV and 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 you know, things in a way that that can maximize your your chances. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? I think just a short comment from me. Uh, I, I think it's it's often quite a misnomer or misunderstanding that arbitration is only quite um, reserved for, for those who are elites or those most sophisticated types of disputes. I think uh, in, in no short contribution due to uh, the perception that arbitration is often a very glamorous type of um, uh, field to be in, but we often forget that um, a lot of arbitrations are arbitrations which are unconnected with any institution, are uh, not large scale um, 
multi-billion dollar disputes. Sometimes they are they do involve much smaller disputes and disputes which are uh, not not the kinds that would normally make the headlines. And so, you know, as much as we like to think that arbitration is, is, is reserved for the elite, we often tend to overlook the fact that a lot more arbitrations do go on at a much smaller scale, but no doubt. Daniel's frozen. <laughs> I'll make a comment just waiting to, for Daniel to come back. I, I think that the person who is worried about being marginalized has to remember that you can't count on um, just being chosen uh, because you are a member of a diverse group. Uh, you've, some, you've been chosen because somebody trusted you. And so you need to make sure that that trust is rewarded by doing the best job you can and making the contribution that they expect of you from your experience, whatever that may be. And um, having worked with some, albeit older people who, who were doing their first arbitration, um, I have sometimes found them to be extremely useful because they are coming from a different place. Um, they're not used to the way things are done in arbitration. Um, they're willing to either suggest new things or question things that they don't understand. Um, another question. Um, since parties have a choice of arbitrators, are parties to the disputes the main culprits for the lack of diversity? I think with respect to, um, to gender diversity in particular, this is one of the things that the, uh, the ICA task force has looked at significantly. Um, and the data shows that institutions generally um, are much better at appointing female arbitrators um, as compared to appointments made by co-arbitrators um, or by the parties. So when you look at the parties, you know, it's not just, you know, the party involved in the arbitration, it's their counsel. Um, counsel has a huge role to play um, in not just appointing the arbitrator, but in presenting um, options um, as to who to appoint as arbitrator in any particular case. So if a law firm is providing their client with, say, five options for arbitrators, um, does that list include any woman? Does it include any, you know, racial or geographic diverse candidates? Um, so I think, you know, law firms have a huge role to play um, in addition to the parties. Um, and then on top of that, more recently, we have the third party funders um, who also may have a say or at least, you know, a voice in whom to appoint as an arbitrator. Um, so I, I think the institutions tend to do a better job. Um, and it's, you know, the parties and their law firms um, in particular that, that do have a ways to go um, in achieving more diversity. Any other comments on that one? I, in, in my um, discussion yeah. earlier, I kind of discussed this issue. Um, parties and legal counsels do have significant role in deciding what arbitrators, who arbitrator, which type of arbitrator they want to pick because it's party autonomy. So the issues really, is, which is inevitable, is unconscious biasness that you have in the community, in the commercial sense, you have someone that you prefer, you want to get to keep these top names that you often deal with. You want people who have similar backgrounds that speak the similar language or have similar culture um, practices um, with you. So that's inevitable. But as Louis suggested earlier, this is, and also the reason why we are all here today, is that when you try to commit or accept someone new, someone not from your comfort zone, Sometimes you get to see things from a different perspective. So this is this anger that we are trying to explain. Well, thank you. And with that, we are coming to the very end of our seminar here. And I'd like to thank our speakers for their wonderful presentations. Um, I'd like to thank AIAC and the ICA Task Force for inviting us to do this presentation today. Um, especially to Irene, uh, who's been um, helping us technically uh, in the background uh, for the hour. And, and to you, our audience, by demonstrating your commitment to diversity by joining us here today. 
and thank you very much. And let's continue the conversation. Keep on charting the way, overcome those ob obstacles and bring more diversity to our field of arbitration. So thank you very much, everybody. On behalf of the AIC, thank you so much, Louise, Ashley, Jennifer, Lillian, Daniel, and thank you to the members of audience who tune in. Uh, I know some of you are um, spending your evening here with us online. Um, it was a very interesting dialogue. And just like Louise said, I hope we keep charting the way, uh, continue breaking barriers, and um, take, let, let's take it from there. Um, just a reminder: Tomorrow we will broadcast. Uh, we will have the um, last uh, tranche of interview for Diversity Week, uh, and we will touch upon the racial and ethnicity diversity. So do uh, visit our YouTube uh, channel um, to um, view the videos and um, follow us on social media platforms to keep uh, to. To, to keep yourself updated with our future events. All right, good um, evening, uh, afternoon, morning, everyone. Hope you have a good rest and good day. Thank you so much again to our panel of speakers. I hope to see you again soon. Take care. Thanks, bye-bye. Bye-bye.